In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Dear Holy Father God, thank you so much for every opportunity we get to spend um, some time together with you in our midst and go deeper in your word. Father, I thank you that the number of the virus cases are decreasing so strongly and so obviously. And uh, thank you, Lord, for the vaccines being more and more available to people. Um, Father, please protect us from putting our hope in the vaccine uh, or putting our safety and comfort in anything or anyone else other than you. Um, help us to always be mindful that our life is in your hand and uh, if you will for us to live and to serve you more uh, then that's what will be. Um, and at the same time, Lord, thank you for all the wonderful lessons that you have taught us from this pandemic and we hope and pray that we learn from them and that we remember them for life. Be with us, O Lord, tonight and give us what we need to hear from you. We ask you to please hear us through the intercession. Say, me and all you saints and martyrs, so please do from the beginning. And the mighty power of your life-giving cross, please, O Lord, make us ready to pray. Thankfully, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us as they are daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one in Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> All righty. Uh, well, last time we are continuing with uh, Isaiah chapter 30. Um, last time we covered through verse 17. I'll mention a few uh, highlights from what we talked about. <clears throat> and I want to invite you, as usual, to... Just jump in or add anything or ask you questions or whatever. Um, first of all, one of the things that really caught our attention was in verse 10 when they were telling uh, the prophets, do not sp uh, speak to, you know, do not prophesy, prophesy to us, uh, do not prophesy to us the right things, but speak to us smooth things and prophesy deceits to us. Um, and we talked about how some so-called Christians reject churches that call them to repent, to adjust their ways according to God's will, to call them to follow and obey God's commandments. And they run after quote-unquote churches that just tell them smooth things and deceits, just tell them things that, that are true, but only the pleasant things. That things that just make me feel good and warm and fuzzy and fluffy and and I don't have any responsibility or or stress that I don't want to have, uh, or even people within the Coptic Orthodox Church who are very happy to read the Bible and to recall the Bible and to quote verses, but only when it comes to encouraging verses and comforting verses and promises from God, but they they actually refuse to accept and follow and obey. Um, they choose to reject verses from the Bible that just do not suit how they think, think things should be. Um, and that's that's another example of it. So, so, you know, nobody's immune from this stuff. We need to watch out for that. And then we talked a little bit about a great question that Rafa brought up, which was, uh, what are some of the reasons that we don't speak up? What are some of the reasons that we stay quiet? Um and I, I tried to write some of your answers uh, as much as I could recall. The ones that I recalled, there was um, selfishness. They were too busy to care uh, for me and being mindful of God's main purpose for creating us. Um, another one was having taken the effort and the time and energy to love on the people and to build good rapport and good relationships with them that would open the door for me later on to speak up. So I haven't invested in a building a relationship. So when the time is right for me to speak, I feel like I don't have enough connection to speak. Um, another one was that we don't really know God for ourselves. Like if I don't know God for myself, not having built a true intimate personal real relationship with him. So I'm not really able to, tell people about who God is to me personally. Um, and of course, within the, each point we know, it tells us what we need to do. Um, another one was being scared of like intimidations and bullying of, you know, like news and media and social media and making us believe that we really, we will really suffer if we say anything about Christianity and really, 
even if we do suffer, which is really unlikely, so what? You know, blessed are you when they value and persecute and see all kinds of evil against you, falsely for my sake. Rejoice and being exceedingly glad. Um, but a lot of this stuff is hyped up for nothing. And if indeed I've been serving people and I've been loving on people and I've built showing, you know, what a true Christian is like, I think they'll be a lot more likely to listen to me or accept it, or at the very least not be all worked up if I say something. Um, the last reason we mentioned was just lack of love. There was just not enough love in my heart for God and for neighbor or for neighbor. It's kind of, it hurts to hear this, but I believe if there were enough love for God and for neighbor, then we would do uh, what is necessary and we speak. And there's of course a bunch of other reasons, but I think if I remember correctly, these are the ones we, we talked about. Um, <clears throat> then we talked about how the, the iniquity of being lying children, which was quoted from earlier in the chapter, uh, which is that, we, you know, the lying children who don't really want to obey God or follow God, at first it will seem like it's working and they're getting away with it. But one day and all of a sudden it will come crashing down on them. Um, and we talked about how if you reject and refuse, if you reject God and refuse to obey and follow his words and you see your life getting worse and worse and you yet you keep ignoring him, then, you know, the rest is inevitable, which is that one day it will come crashing down violently and swiftly, kind of like a, the, the wall of a dam that's been cracked uh, or, or fragmented somehow and like eventually it just gives in under all the pressure. So it'll be violent and swift and, and there will be like no fixing it really might be too late by then. <clears throat> and it said like neither fire nor water will work. Like in other words, nothing will fix it. And then we looked at uh, a phrase that was mentioned multiple times in that small section that we covered last week, which is that the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, how God keeps telling them that he is the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, because he's trying again and again and again to remind them of who he is. It's almost like God is begging them to trust in him and believe in him and obey him and follow him. Not because he's egotistical, like come to me, you know, like, but rather because he wants them all saved and spending eternity with him. And he loves them so much that he just has to keep trying and trying over and over, calling them to repentance. Um, and, and he even goes down to the level where instead of them being the people of God, he's reducing himself, you will, if you will, and kind of uh, attaching himself to them. And he's calling himself the God of the people, the God of Israel. Um, and then we got to that famous verse, which is verse 15, where it says that in quietness and confidence shall be your strength. And that because in quietness and confidence shall be your strength, this is why the world and the prince of this world are fighting us with the opposite of quietness and confidence, meaning, yeah, and, and actually quite successfully at that. Um, but they're fighting the, the quietness and confidence with noise and busyness. And, and why did I choose busyness instead of like, not only noise and busyness, but like, how does he fight our confidence? By simply throwing a million opinions and ideologies at you so that you have no confidence of any. It's almost like when uh, an animal is hunting or, or, you know, catching fish or something and they come in the school and there's a herd and they're running all over the place and they're like, they're looking here and there and there's like, you know, not able to focus on one specific one. So, so instead of the other theories that the enemy tried, which is like kill them, get rid of them, and they weren't working and was only causing Christianity to get stronger. Now he's figured it out and he said, okay, no problem. Christianity is this, Christianity is that. Christianity is also this. And there's other things other than Christianity. And this is okay. And this is okay. And that's truth. And this truth. And that's truth. And so by muddling the water and throwing so much in it, uh, by throwing like a million opinions and ideologies to you so that you have no confidence in any. And, and that's why the church is always exhorting her children to build and grow the habit of contemplation and journaling in quiet time. This is to help 
a slowdown and to be in the word of God and in the church fathers always, because this helps us focused on one good source. And this will help us to be confident. And those who remain in the word and in the church fathers and all that stuff that was given to us, their confidence is strong and they can differentiate and recognize if it lines up with it. Yes. If not, then no. So their confidence is stronger. Um, <clears throat> And then the last thing we talked about was the method of fleeing or escaping. And, and we said how fleeing or escaping is the method that many people resort to when things aren't right in their life, whether by ignoring the problem or avoiding discussions that can help a relationship and bring resolutions or burying their head in the sand or escaping via like drugs and alcohol or or food, or through sleep, or watching TV, or social media, or just escaping through hobbies, or any kind of busyness, just any kind of like not dealing with the issue of escaping. Um, and we said escaping never works for two simple reasons. One is that nothing is being resolved, so you're simply postponing the inevitable, which is sooner or later you'll have to face the problem, the issue, the matter. And number two is that the problem or the matter gets bigger and more daunting over time if you don't deal with it. So escaping is no good <laughs> uh, in a nutshell. Um, and then that brings us to where we are right now, which is the coming message passage is just overwhelmingly unbelievable about how awesome our gracious God is. It's just really cool. Um, any comments or questions or anything until this point? All righty. Let's go on then. Uh, let's see. Let's verse 18 through 26. Yeah, 18 through 26. Um, Let's see, who will read for us? I can read. Thank you. I love that you volunteer quickly to read. This is awesome. I, was I, can't, wait. I, I can't wait to like y'all are racing. No, no, I'll read. <laughs> I just came for this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so in that case, Fadwa, would you read for us, please? No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm kidding. Go ahead, Munir. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Therefore, the Lord will wait <coughs> that he may be gracious to you, and therefore he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. For the people shall dwell in the yon at Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will be very gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. And though the Lord gives you the, the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teachers will not be moved into a corner anymore, but your eyes shall see your teachers. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way you walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right land or whenever you turn to the left, you will also defile the covering of your image of silver and the ornament of your molded image of gold. You will throw them away as an unclean thing you will say to them, get away. Then he will give the rain for your seed with which you sow the ground and bread of the increase of the earth. It will be fat and plentiful. In that day, your cattle will feed in large pastures. Likewise, the oxen and the young donkeys that work the ground will eat cured fodder, which has been winnowed with the shovel and van. There will be an envy high mountain every, on every high mountain and on every high hill, rivers and streams of waters, 
in the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall. Moreover, the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold as the light of seven days. In the day that the Lord binds up the bruise of his people and heals the stroke of their wounds. Glory to the Holy Trinity, Amen. our God, forever. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Um, so, as you know, this whole chapter that we've been, we've been in, in a nutshell, basically, the Jews, because of fear from Syria and Assyria, they were thinking and decided to go to Egypt to get help and comfort and support um, instead of going to God. So, remember how last week we talked about Psalm 26, 14? The one that says, wait for the Lord, be of good cheer, let your heart be strengthened and take courage and wait for the Lord. Well, God is so gracious and so kind that even when we are lying children, as mentioned early in the chapter, who do not seek him or wait on him, verse 18 says what? Therefore, the Lord will wait. Can you believe that? Okay. You don't want to wait on the Lord? Okay. I will wait on you. It's, it's mind-boggling. And then he ends verse with 18 with, Blessed are all those who wait for him. He's trying to encourage them to wait for him because that's what's best for them. Remember, all means all, and that's all means. So blessed are all who wait for him. So every single person, without exception, who waits for the Lord, blessed are they. They will not be disappointed. They will not be confounded. They will not regret waiting for the Lord. And as we will read later on in, in chapter 40, in Isaiah 40, 31, it's one of those famous verses. I'm sure you've heard it a million times. But those who wait on the Lord shall what? Do you remember the rest of that verse? It's talking about those who wait on the Lord. Shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. How awesome would that be? I would want those things. And so I would want to be a person who knows how to wait on the Lord. So what does waiting on the Lord look like? Now I'm asking you. I, I want you to answer this. In case there's some of us who maybe aren't sure. What, what does that mean, waiting on the Lord? You know, Just sit there and wait. Or what? Tell me ways or, or things that we can do that mean we are waiting on the Lord. Or that look like, you know, what does waiting on the Lord look like? I'd say, Abuna, if I'm waiting for someone, I should, like, make my mind full of thinking about him. Let's say that I'm waiting about uh, someone is coming to me. So first I have to uh, make my mind occupied with all, or simply all my emotions, all my thoughts, all my heart should be like occupied by this way. Oh, so you mean uh, keeping your eyes on him? Yes. Watching like, for him to, okay. Watching like. Yeah. This is going to sound really like, insulting but believe me it's not it's not my intention but but i think you'll you'll understand exactly what i'm talking about those of you who have a dog or a cat okay if if it's like time to eat you know or like you have like that dog food box or can or whatever and that animal sees you what are they doing they're waiting on you but what are they doing like their eyes are like i mean you move to the right they move to the right you move to the left they move to the left it's like is it now are you doing it yeah is it coming and so they have their eyes on on him, waiting on him. Okay, good. What else? I see it as um, like having faith in his works and his plan. So waiting to see what he has in store for us and being patient and faithful, knowing that he's going to protect us at all times. Very good. Very good. Being patient. Um, one of the things that I was taught and I learned the hard way is that you know, when I'm waiting on God, don't rush things. And until then, I just keep doing what I'm doing. So be patient. 
thank you. Mariam, you were going to say something? Mariam uh, Andur? It was me, Abuna. Oh, uh, Fadwa, sorry. That's okay. Continuing to pray and grow in faith, even without seeing any signs of having our prayers answered. Awesome. So keep remain in prayer and keep praying. Some people say, well, like, I prayed, he heard it, now I'm waiting, so I'm done praying. No. When, how can I be patient? <laughs> how can I be patient? <laughs> um, I, I guess it's something we can pray for, and I, and I think... I guess what will help me to be more patient is to recall, to keep my eyes on God, kind of like Munim are saying, and to remind myself, he sees me, he hears me, he knows what is right, he knows, you know, what is the right time, uh, he's never too early, he's never too late, this will help me remain patient, this will help me be at peace until he does or doesn't do whatever he wants to do. Uh, I think yeah, that that would help me be more more patient. Yes, because when we are impatient on something, we are impatient because we want it to happen it now. We, have, we want to happen it sooner. But when we remind ourselves that God, uh, God's timing is the right timing, if, if it is sooner, then God's timing is not good. Uh, the same way, if it's later, this in itself uh, will make will help us be patient that uh, if I expect something, even if it's good, if I expect it sooner than God's plan, uh, this, one, uh, this will help setting my mind at peace. One thing also, also, sorry, go ahead. Regarding waiting on the Lord, when, when someone waiting on someone, when we wait on someone, we prepare ourselves for the meeting meeting with, with that person so waiting on the lord involves preparing ourselves to meet him so, uh, like uh, in the parable jesus mentioned when he said blessed are those servants whom their master when he comes we find them doing so so if i'm if i'm waiting on the lord i should be prepare myself for the moment i meet with him and this involves doing good works. Uh, Very good. Prepared. That's a great point. Um, one thing I was going to say about the what can help me be more patient, as you were talking about, Fat, um, is that I remind myself that impatience makes me lose what I already have today because I didn't get what I wanted yet. So... I can have this and this and this and this and this. And all these things can be just right in my life and I love them. But because I'm focused on the thing that I don't have yet and, I, and I'm and i not doing something to calm myself down and to make myself more patient, I lose my joy today and I lose sight of the things that I have now. So to kind of remind myself that impatience is really, it, it steals my joy and my peace. And I don't want that. So I will help to train myself to be more patient. Okay, cool. You guys pretty much answered all I have down. For those who just joined us, we are talking about what does waiting on the Lord looks like? And we said, not rushing things, being patient. We said, choosing to be content with how things are right now. Because if I'm, I don't know if we mentioned this, but like, if I'm like a spoiled brat kind of, and like, I get this, uh, thank you, God. Now I want this. Thank you, God. Now I want this. Let Tub sit there and like, it, learn to be content is i think it's something we need to have like a whole convention on it's like that elusive virtue um and the word is the world is training us to not be content uh i mean daily but choosing to be content of of how things are right now until god decides to do something if he decides to do something this is waiting on the lord um remaining in prayer to keep praying y'all mentioned that one while waiting on the lord um one thing i've uh yeah, I don't think I'll have mentioned this one. It's self-examination. It's to self-examine and to talk with my father confession, lest perhaps while I'm waiting on the Lord, it's actually the Lord who is waiting on me. Um, remember that example of the rich uh, 
men who wanted to get his son a car that I, we talked about a long, long time ago. So, so maybe the thing that I want is also something that God wants to give me, but the reason he's not giving it to me yet or granting it yet or making it happen yet, because I'm not ready for it, or if it is to happen, it's going to distract me or be a detriment to me. So this is a, a good opportunity for me to self-examine and to introspect and to see if there's something in me that is causing God to wait on me. For example, let's say I'm a youth who, who like wants to get married. Okay. And he's asking God, look, like, where, where, you know, where have all the cowboys gone? Like, you know, I want to get married. And it's possible that God also has someone prepared or, or, or is, is happy for you to get married, but I'm not at a mature enough level or at a spiritual level or whatever that's ready for marriage. And if I get married now, it's going to be a disaster. So it's possible that God is waiting for me to work on things, to repent on things or whatever, and then to permit for that marriage to come. Um, another one that y'all, uh, I think, yeah, y'all kind of mentioned this, which is to keep living life according to God's commandments to the best of my ability. Um, some people get mad while they're waiting and they choose not to live life according to God's will while waiting. It's almost like, uh, like a spiritual temper tantrum, if you will, uh, like, or, or like, really a, a conditional Christianity, meaning I will live according to commandments of God, but only as long as you do what I want when I want it. And if, and if I ask for something that doesn't happen, I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to go to church as if I'm doing God a favor. So, so this will be something to do while waiting on the Lord as well, is to, to show to God and to myself that my Christianity and worship of him is not conditional. So going back to uh, the verse, uh, verse 18, is that God is waiting on us, actually on every single human being, to choose him. And even if they reject him, he will patiently and graciously await uh, for when everything comes crumbling down. Like as we said, when it will be like a, like a crack in the, in the wall of the dam, he's going to wait for everything to just come crumbling down on our heads and then like we cry out to him. Um, and that, that brings us in, in verse 19. When this happens, he will be very gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. So in verse 18, is telling us that the Lord, uh, therefore the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. Okay. And... Uh, he will be very gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. Okay, so he's waiting for things to just naturally take their you know, natural process so that once you get to that point, you get on your knees and you cry out to him, he'll run and swoop in and tell you, here I am, and he will answer you. And he wants them to what dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. We're still in verse 19. What is Zion at Jerusalem? has a couple of meanings. What is Zion at Jerusalem? We should know this by now. Is, Whenever. is Zion um, like a, um, a metaphor or euphemism for St. Mary? It can be, but, okay. but in this situation, it's, it's more. The church, the house of God. The church, that's, mm -hmm. yes. So, so, he wants them to dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Whenever we read this in, in, in the book of Isaiah, it's going to mean here on earth, it will mean the church. And in eternity, it will mean the heavenly Jerusalem. Okay. Where there will be weeping no more. See, they shall weep no more. And even though you, like the people, you rejected your prophets and your teachers, God will not let it be so. Because if there are no more teachers and prophets, how will his children learn anything or have a chance of returning? So uh, in verse 20, he says, "What well, your teachers will not be moved into a corner anymore, but your eyes shall see your teachers. 
So even in their captivity, God sent them many prophets and teachers. And also in the New Testament, he ascended and left them many prophets and teachers. For from which yani, we learn even until today. Um, as it says in Acts 14, 17, he did not leave himself without, you know the rest? He did not leave himself without witness. witness. Yes, very good. He did not leave himself without witness. So oh, even I though they were... Know. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I don't know why I don't see a Coptic uh, reader on my screen. Um, do I, am I doing something wrong? Uh, do the rest of you see it? I see it. You don't see it? Okay. Um, uh, it's probably a setting if you're on your phone. Um, maybe if you tap the screen and then choose which screen to view, like speaker view or the shared screen or what. If it, if it doesn't work, I guess you can just uh, leave the meeting and join, join back in maybe. Um, okay. 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 Um, but even though they only wanted people to speak to them smooth stuff and to speak to them deceits, God is saying, no way, I'm not going to give in to this ridiculous request. I'm going to keep sending you prophets and teachers. Because kind of like in the New Testament, right, that says, how will they believe if they're not here? And how will they hear if nobody was sent? And how was, and so on. So God is like, well, I got to keep sending you teachers. This is how I reach you. This is how I talk to you. So he will never leave himself without witness. The verse 21 is lovely and sad at the same time. <clears throat> is this better, Sazar Um I didn't see the right icon. No. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. So even if, or if you have a Bible on you, if you have Coptic Reader on your phone or whatever, you can uh, just to grab yeah. it. We're in Isaiah 30, verse 21. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm there. Okay. Um, so verse 21, I was saying it's both lovely and sad at the same time. So it says, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way you walk in it. So God will keep sending them teachers and prophets to tell them this is the way you walk in it. So this is the, this is the, the lovely part, the good news part. But did you notice what he said before that? In the same verse? There's a key word that is kind of sad. Behind? Behind, exactly. He said, you, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way you walk in it. What does this mean behind you? It means that those teachers and prophets, they keep like talking to you and you like ignore them. If you can picture this, like you're ignoring them and proceed to walk away and they will keep walking behind you, like begging you saying, wait, this is the way you walk in it. Don't go. Um, and we see that in today's world, like how the priests, in some cases, like become annoying to people because they keep seeking after people and like calling them, like visiting them and tell, exhorting them to come back to God, come back on the right path. Please stop this. Please do that. And kind of walking behind them, begging them to return to God. So it's kind of like the Canaanite woman who was walking behind the Lord and the apostles for them to hear to heal her daughter. And they were, like, they were kind of ignoring her and like she would keep walking behind them, pestering them. And this is like the same thing, but only in reverse. Now the prophets and the teachers are walking behind these people and begging them, please, here's the right way, do this. And it's kind of an indication of them. They're just not, a, you know, not listening to them or ignoring them. Verse 22, it says, you will also defile the covering of your images of silver and the ornament of your molded images of gold. You will throw them away as an unclean thing. You will say to them, get away. So every single person who rejects God and doesn't want to go to the right way and leaves it behind them, and they choose the world or anything in the world, sooner or later, this is a guarantee, Sooner or later, they will realize that they trusted in useless idol things. That it, now it may take decades, <laughs> in some cases, it takes a lifetime. But the wiser we are, the sooner this will happen. Sooner or later, they will come to this realization and they will get to a point where they hate those idols 
that uh, they trusted in one time and they will want them away from them, like get away from me. Um, you know how we read in um, verse 18 that the Lord is waiting for them? This is what the Lord is waiting for. He's waiting for like people to realize that they were duped and to sincerely reject their idols. And then when they cry out to God and say, yeah, I was wrong. I want you. Then he will swoop in and say, answer and say, here I am when you call on me. And then verse 23 and 24 says, then he will give the rain for your seed. Then, meaning what? when they get to a point where they hate these things that, that they were trusting in, and, and they get to a point where they realize how futile all this was, then he will give you rain for your seed, which you sow in the ground, and bread for the increase of the earth. It will be fat and plentiful. In that day, your cattle will feed in large pastures. Likewise, the oxen and the young donkeys that work the ground will eat cured fodder, which has been winnowed, with a shovel and fan. Rain and seed and bread and fat. In other words, he will bless their life. God, and I, I love this about God, and I thank God for him, and I thank God for this, which is that God does not hold grudges. I love this about our God doesn't matter how many times I rejected him. If I get to a point where I say, uncle, where I say, yes, I want you, he swoops in and he doesn't sit there. Remember and how many times and uh, I tried this and it's like he comes in and he showers me with rain and seed and fat and, and, and good food and all this stuff. I love this reminded me of uh, Malachi 3.7. Malachi 3.7. Okay, he says, yet from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Even though from the days of your fathers you've been rejected me, just return to me and I will return to you. And by the way, return to me is what? Just turn. Metanoia. You turn. You don't even have to start walking towards me. It's kind of like the prodigal son. As soon as he turned, took one step in the direction of his father, his father ran and took the rest of the, the path and swooped him up in his arms. And by the way, the rain and the seed and the fat, this is not just earthly blessings. What is rain a symbol of? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. People usually ask, why does Abuna like sprinkle us with water at the end of the liturgy? What is that? And actually, it's because, I think I mentioned this before, during the liturgy, we recall our whole story, the big picture. From creation to the fall, to the incarnation, to the crucifixion, well, to the Last Supper, to the crucifixion and the resurrection, right? And then actually, the sprinkle in the water is a commemoration of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon um, the people. So rain is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. What about bread? That one's obvious. The Word of God. And the body of God. And yes, the, the Eucharist, correct. Men shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, but also the actual bread, like the Eucharist, the body and the blood of the Lord. Okay, what about the cattle, the ox, and the donkeys? What are they a symbol of? These are called beasts of burden. Bodies. Yes, very good. They're a symbol of our bodies, that like the do actions, that do the work. So even they will be blessed because they all they need is just to eat and drink. So it's saying God will take care of your bodily needs as well as your spiritual needs. And not only that, but as we know, uh, such animals are supposed to just, you know, eat, you know, hay and strong grass, right? That's what they feed them. But no, he's saying what he will take care of the bodily needs with style, right? He says what you will eat cured fodder. I'm not sure what fodder is, but it's cured. It's something special, you know, with which has been winnowed with the shovel and the fan. Like it's been nicely and carefully and meticulously prepared. It's not just good at any stuff like you throw it for them to, to eat. So he'll take care of the spiritual feeding and also the physical needs. And the physical needs will not be minimal, will be done with, with plenty, with style. 
Remember that verse? A good measure filled up, shaken, and flowing over will be pushed into your bosom. <clears throat> um, verse 25, it says, There will be on every high mountain and on every high hill rivers and streams of waters. In the day of the great slaughter, when the towers fall. This is a very allegorical um, verse. Okay, The nourishing pure water of rivers and streams will be on all, the great and the simple. Okay, On everywhere, the mountains and the hills. God will shower them all. And it says, well, the towers will fall. So the towers will fall. Here's two things. So not only it's a symbol of like no more wars, okay, will torment us, like what happened with the Syrian army, but also a symbol of the arrogant and the prideful. They will fall, come crashing down. Because once we get to a point where I say uncle, where I realize that none of this world is real and is futile, and I see how dependent I am and my weaknesses, how can I be arrogant? Before God. All the stuff, Yanni. Like they say, you know, the, the school of life, it's it's a tough school, but it's very effective. Um, then verse 26, it says, Moreover, the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold as the light of seven days in the day that the Lord binds up the bruises of his people and heals the stroke of their wounds. So light means um, vision, revelation. It's kind of exactly like what we're talking about in that three-part sermon thesis that are, that's called the, the journey of enlightenment, about the, the, the allegory of the man born blind. It's not an allegory. It's a natural thing that happened, but that, that we've been doing on Sundays. Um, so the, the enlightenment will, will increase so much, and you'll be able to see so many things that you couldn't ever see before. We're completely oblivious to at the point of returning to God and saying, okay, all my idols are useless. I want you. So when a person messes up, rejects God, eventually suffers enough to the point of hating the idols that they were relying on and then returning to God, God will bind up their bruises and heal their wounds. And he will rush in and say, here I am. And he will shower them with rain and bread and seed and even the animals, he'll feed them with style. Even their physical needs, he'll feed it with style. And not only that, but God will proceed to dealing with the enemy of his children, which is what we'll read next in the next passage. So at the same time, he's dealing with his children who return to him, but now he's also going to be dealing with the enemies of his children who are terrifying and tormenting them. Because he said, don't go to Egypt. Well, God, the Assyrians still want to attack us and kill us. And the king of Assyria, who's a symbol of Satan, is trying to destroy us. He's like, don't worry. So you turn to me. I'll take care of you. And now watch what I will do to your enemies. That's the next passage that we will read next. Any questions or comments so far? I have a comment, Abuna. Ah, Habibi. Uh, in the previous uh, verse 25, I noticed something, but I'm not sure if it is like, so it say uh, there will be like rivers and streams in every high mountain. And actually, usually in the mountain, there is no rivers. Like it's, it's hard, like the river will be uh, like high to the mountain. Is this is kind of like to tell us that this is not like the regular river, but it's coming from above from God. It's like not like the regular uh, what we see in the world. Yes. Or, yeah, it's it's yes. because it's it's unusual to to have a rivers or streams on the mountains in the high mountains. And it's also a symbol of like that all people like that return to him the great and the simple, those who are the rich and the poor, the, those who are well read and those who are not, those who are like all levels, they will be nourished with this pure water that's coming from above. From above. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Thank you. When, isn't it uh, this too much rivers? As we know, rivers a sign of a uh, good thing, Yanni. Could be the life will be in peace so long you are uh, following God and tolerating everything for the sake of God, for the sake of his name. 
So all these waters are from him actually. He's, he's giving us peace and calmness and strength. Could it be or? Yes, with think about rivers and stream and what they carry, whether it be sustenance, you know, fish, nourishing water, refreshing water, clean water that cleanses and wash. Um, all those good things, that's all the symbols of like, you know, God showering us with all these blessings on everywhere when we return to him. So, yeah, yes. Anyone else? Ready to move on? Okay, let's move on. Um, so now I'll need someone to read from verse 27 through 33. Hmm. I will. Okay, thank you. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar, burning with his anger, and his burden is heavy. His lips are full of indignation and his tongue like a devouring fire. His breath is like an overflowing stream, which reaches up to the neck to sift the nations with the sieve of futility. And there shall be a bridle in the jaws of the people, causing them to err. You shall have a song as in the night when a holy festival is kept, gladness of heart as when one goes with a flute, to come into the mountain of the Lord to the mighty one of Israel. The Lord will cause his glorious voice to be heard and show the descent of his arm with the indignation of his anger and the flame of a devouring fire, with the scattering tempest and hailstones. For through the voice of the Lord, Assyria will be beaten down as he strikes with the rod. And in every place where the staff of punishment passes, which the Lord lays on him, it will be with tambourines and harps. And in battles of brandishing, he will fight with it. For Tophet was established of old, yes, for the king, it is prepared. He has made it deep and large. Its pyre is fire with much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, kindles it. Thank you. Glory to the Holy Trinity, our God, forever. Amen. All right, let's take this um, verse by verse. Verse 27, it says, Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar. Isn't this interesting? Not the Lord, the name of the Lord comes from afar. The name of the Lord is itself very powerful. Very, very powerful. Very powerful. I mean, just with his name, like one can cast out demons, believing. Okay. So this helps explain uh, a little bit the power of the Jesus prayer, just saying the name of the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, son of the living God. And to say this regularly, um, or like we've read before, we quote this verse a bunch before Proverbs 18, 10, that has to do with the name of the Lord. Remember that? Speaking of towers, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs to it and is safe. Like they, to go hide in the name of the Lord. What are some of the names of the Lord and their significance? The There's word. a lot. So what yeah. you? Word. The word. The word. The logos. Okay. Banner. Yeah. The law. And uh, the wisdom. So the word and the wisdom. So wisdom. Is, logos. Yeah. The reason. Okay. Very good. Also the light. Light. Truth. Yeah, I want to hear from everybody. In the way. The way. <laughs> the way. Did anyone mention Savior? Savior. The rock. The rock. Son of Light. You know. As I was preparing for this, I dug deep a little bit in the name of the Lord. And as I was writing this, I can't tell you how overwhelmed I, I felt. So at first I wrote a few, like, like you're saying, so Jesus, that's his name. And Jesus means savior. He's the one who saves. Mm -hmm. 
God it's not just to utter the, the words, but like what they mean. He's Emmanuel, right? And Emmanuel means he's God with us. He will never leave us, nor forsake us. He's the good shepherd. He's the good shepherd. Means his eyes are always watching over us. And he takes care of all our needs. He's the just judge. He is just and he will judge. And he has no partiality. These are all things like if I remember them, if I simply remember them, it will affect so much of how I live my life. He's the warrior. Remember Exodus 15, 3 is one of my favorite verses. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. We say this in Tazbaha. Is the saint Abuna al-Mursal? Yes. Uh, uh, the messenger or the saint. Uh, or oh, the um, One thing also like, uh, so the warrior, like he fights for us. One thing you've mentioned already, which is the rock. And just not just a name, but again, he's like the strong foundation, stability, assurance, comfort. Those who stand on him are never shaken or washed away by the storms. The you know what I'm saying? So, so yes, Sorry. the redeemer. I, we get the, we get the point. Yes. So so, but my point is that not just to utter those names, but to meditate on, on those names. To sit there one time, like we were talking earlier about quiet time and contemplation and journaling and stuff like that, is to sit there and write one of those names and to think about it. What does that mean to me? Amazing, overwhelming comfort and peace. Well, like we read before, and remember Isaiah 9, verse 6? Wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Each one of those is a story. So as I was doing my research, I found one that had a hundred names for our Lord Jesus Christ. And actually, I'm going to give you a gift and I'm going to copy and paste them because I found the, the, the each name and its reference. Uh, is it being sent? There you go. I just put it in the chat. So, and, and they're like, they're alphabetical, like the advocate, the almighty, the alpha and the omega, the amen, the apostle of our profession, um, the atoning sacrifice of our sin, the author of life, author, perfect of our faith, author of salvation, beginning and end, blessed and only lure, the bread of God, the bread of life, the bridegroom, the capstone, the chief cornerstone, the chief shepherd, Christ, the Messiah. Um, Creator, deliverer, eternal life, faithful and true, faithful witness. Um, and it just goes on and on and on. And like, there's like so many rabbi, righteous one, the resurrection and the life, the ruler of God's creation, the son of David, the son of the most high, the son of man, the stone, the builders rejected, and so on. Um, all the way to W, to the word of God. So, Really, like Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs to it and hides in it and is safe. Perhaps this can be something I can do if, you know, the fast is about to start. It's 55 days. Let's say it's 50 days, you know, if you take out a whole week. And, and these are 100 names. What if I take like just two names a day and just... Look them up, look at the verse where they are written, and just think about this a little bit. And what does that mean to me? I think it'd be a wonderful uh, exercise. So behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar. Burning with his anger, and his burden is heavy. His lips are full of indignation, his tongue like a devouring fire. Like, what happened to all this wonderful stuff? What's going on? Well, while all these names we just looked at of our Lord Jesus Christ are very comforting, they are also a terrifying terror to those who kept rejecting him to the end. Okay? 
so terrifying that they are seeking a terrible death even, like begging for the rocks and the stones to fall on them to cover them, as we read in Revelation. Okay? So, verse 28, it says, His breath is like an overflowing stream. So remember, we're talking about the streams of the rivers coming from above and the nourishing and the, all that stuff and the rain and the seed and the fat and the special cured fodder. At the same time, his breath is like an overflowing stream. That doesn't sound so nice. Which reaches up to the neck to sift the nations with the sieve of futility. And there shall be a bridle in the jaws of the people, causing them to err. So... This prophecy of the water covering up to the neck and leaving the head actually came true. And we will read this in Isaiah 37 with Sennacherib. Sennacherib, the king of the Assyrian, that they were terrified of. Okay, As we know, in one breath, God killed the 185,000 of the army. But he left Sennacherib. He, he spared him. So he spared the head. It went up to the neck, washed all that stuff. Okay. And what happened is when Sennacherib went into the temple of his idols after losing the 185,000, um, his two sons, as you know the story, they came in and they killed him right before his idol. Dying with his army would have been a much better death. But God spared the head for a special treatment, for a special yani. Uh, shameful death, if you will, betrayal by his two sons who killed him in front of his useless idol who you know, was utterly useless in saving him or helping him. And then he calls here what? To save the nations with the sieve of futility. The sieve of futility meaning that the nations are sifted and they are all lacking. They all fall through the sieve. Nothing good um, in them remains or is caught in the sieve. Lhol Gorbel. So that was for the enemies of God's children. Now, what about God's children who remain in him and live according to his commandments to the end? It's verse 29. <clears throat> it says, you shall have a song as in the night when a holy festival is kept and gladness of heart as when one goes with a flute to come into the mountain of the Lord to the mighty one of Israel. God's children when they see this happen to their enemies that they were so terrified of and they are once for all saved and that they are on the right side of God, not on his left, will break into singing and celebrating. They can't help it. It's exactly like the song that how the Israelites broke into singing when they saw God what they saw God did for their enemies, with their, for the oppressors, the Egyptians, how he just closed the Red Sea on them once and for all. They are done. There's no way they, they're like going to come back ever. Okay? That's the first canticle in, in the Midnight Praises, the first host. Let us sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the strider, he has cast into the sea. Um, so continue with verse 29. It says, with gladness of heart, as when one goes with a flute to come into the mountain of the Lord, to the mighty one of Israel. This bring up a question, uh, brings up a question here. What is your attitude or demeanor when you are going to church? Is it with gladness of heart because you're going up to the mountain of the Lord? to me and connect with God? Is it something you really look forward to? Is it something like, like you feel like, oh, finally, I'm going to go and plug into God and like recharge? Or is it something you just do? Or is it something you dread? Or like, do I have to go? You know? Um, like, that's what it's talking about. Like with gladness of heart, because you're going up to the mountain of the Lord to meet him. This reminded me of Psalm 122. You know, the Psalms of the Ascent in the 11th hour says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates of Jerusalem. Um, when when somebody says, come on, let's go to church. I'm like, okay, you know, or like, yes, let's do this. In general, do you delight in your relationship with God? It's not just church. 
but in your relationship with God, if it's time to pray, if it's time to read the Bible, if it's time to come to the Bible study, some, something you'd like to do or not, I'd like to think that you all do because you're here. Um, let's go to verse 30. So it says, the Lord will cause his glorious voice to be heard. He will cause his voice to be heard and show the descent of his arm with the indignation of his anger and a flame of a devouring fire with scattering tempests and hailstones. Do you know how some people say, I don't hear God talking to me. I don't see God working in my life. I think God is just totally ignoring me and stuff like that. What do you think about that? Uh, I'm not going to say, did you say those things before? Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. But probably all of us heard people um, say, say such things. Oh, okay, whoever wants the list of the names, you can just uh, uh, text me and I will um, try to text it to you or email it to you. So going back to your, to the questions, what do you think about people who say, I don't hear from God, I don't see God working, I think God is ignoring me, etc. <laughs> Excuse me. What do you think about that? I think maybe they're not paying attention. I mean, God speaks to us through a lot of ways. And, you know, literally nature can be one of the ways. Cool. Thank you. So, so are we all in agreement that God is talking and that God is acting? Um, God, let me just to, to clarify this, since there's a lot of silence here. God is always talking to us. God is always involved and working in our life. God is always attentive to us and hearing our prayers. But it is only when we enter and remain in a true, genuine, intimate, personal, real relationship with him that we begin to hear his voice and see his arm working in our life and see him responding to our prayers. Because, you know, like, you can see people saying, where's God? Why is God ignoring me? And then you can see people, wow, God is like, he's doing this and he's doing that. And I hear him, he's talking to me and he's responding and he's answering prayers and he's all this stuff. He's the same God. So the difference is in, in my perception. Um, so just let's all agree to this. God is always talking to us, always revealing himself to us, and he's always working and involved in our life. He's not an absent father. Okay, And by the way, if you are paying attention, what is the voice of God and the arm of God? Um, the voice is the Holy Spirit. Hmm. And the arm. It's hard to tell, but I would say the voice is the Holy Spirit. The arm is the Lord himself, our Lord Jesus Christ. Because so, he said, your right hand uh, made wonders, O oh Lord. So uh, both of them, actually, it's our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the incarnate God. So he is the word of God or the voice of God. Okay. And the incarnate God, the visible God that did actions in front of us, like he's the arm of God. He's, he's the, the God's involvement among his creation. So instead of saying, like, what is the voice of God and the arm of God, I should have asked, who is the voice of God and the arm of God? So if you read that verse again, <clears throat> so the Lord or God will cause his, vo his glorious voice to be heard and show the descent of his arm. Even the word descent, like how it's, the arm is coming down. And again, it's a great comfort for those who walk with God. But then the second verse, what? It's a terror for those who do not with indignation of his anger and a flame of devouring fire with scattering tempest and hailstones. Um, verse 31, it says, For through the voice of the Lord, so through our Lord Jesus Christ, 
Assyria will be beaten down as he strikes with the rod. Do you want to conquer your Assyria, your enemy, your oppressor? You can do that only through the word of God. Okay, some examples of this, like if, if the enemy or the king of Assyria is trying to scare you, you can respond well with Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. If he tries to attack you with despair and tell you you're a failure, you're never going to work out, you keep betraying God, you can respond with Micah 7, 8. You know, Micah 7, 8, do not gloat over me, O my enemy. Though I fall, I will rise again. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light for me. Or, or you can respond with Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is how you conquer the king of Assyria when he attacks you. If he tries to sadden you and to bring you dumb, down, you can, re, you know, repeat Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, I will say rejoice. If he tries to get you to whine and to complain and to join the pity party with other people, you can recall Romans 8, 28 and say, God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love the Lord. All things and so on. So verse 31 again, it's through the voice of the Lord or through the word of God or through God's word, okay, which is the Bible, scripture. It is written, it is written, it is written. It is through the, that that Assyria will be beaten down as he strikes with the rod. <clears throat> Verse 32. And in every place where the staff of punishment passes, which the Lord lays on him, it will be with tambourines and harps, and in battles of brandishing, he will fight with it. Do you see how the last few chapters, like, Half of the verse is like positive and nice, and then the other half is like scary. Um, notice that, for example, he called them in verse 30, a devouring fire. See, and the flame of a devouring fire. So God's fire is the same fire, but to the oppressor, to the unbelievers, to Assyria and the king of Assyria who remain in their state, it is a devouring, destroying fire. And to the believers, the children of God who remain in the living life, in living life according to his commandments, it is a refining fire. It is a purifying, cleansing, purging fire. It's a fire that makes me more pure and more precious. Okay. And verse 33 says, For Tophet was established of old remember that word of old we talked about this before yes he's confirming it was established of old for the king it is prepared notice it's a small k here what king is he talking about the king he mentioned in verse um 31 the king of assyria or the devil. Yes, Satan, exactly. For Tophet was established of old for the king it is prepared. Prepared, He has made it deep and large. Its pyre is fire with much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, kindles it. Now the breath of the Lord, which is that breathes life into us, it also breathes a stream of brimstone and kindles that fire in Tophet. Tophet, for those who don't know, it was a place for Molech, the god of the Ammonites, <clears throat> where where they they would light a fire in front of this huge copper uh, statue or bronze statue of Molech, and they would cast their children alive into that burned into that fire as burnt offerings. Um, and King Josiah removed this worship and made this place in the valley of uh, Hinnom, Ibn Hinnom. And it made it, made it a, a, a garbage dump site or a landfill, if you will. And they would throw in it all kinds of trash and the waste of the animal offerings that were offered. Um, and they would like, in order to get rid of it, they would like light it all on fire. And because there was like 
it was a perpetual fire because like it was continuously fueled with garbage and more you know animal waste and stuff like that so that place was full of garbage and fire so that they do not use this place ever again for pagan worship but like I was saying earlier in verse 33, it says it was established of old, meaning that this everlasting fire of Gehenna, or we say that in Arabic, like Gehenna, was always in the eternal intention of God, in the everlasting mind of God, prepared from of old for the devil and his armies, for the king of Assyria or Satan and um. If, if this, we see this image often, actually, we saw it in Matthew 20, 25, I'm sorry, 20, in Matthew 25, when, when he separates the, the sheep on his right and the goats on his left, and he said, come into to the ones on his right, he said, come into the, the kingdom that has been prepared for you. But then to the ones on the left, he said, go into the everlasting fire that was prepared for the devil and his demons. And then we read about that also near the very end of the Bible in Revelation 2010. This is like the grand finale, like when, we, uh, when we're holding candles, right, on Ap Apocalypse in Revelation 2010. And it says, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also. They've already been thrown there. And they will be torment day and night forever and ever. The everlasting fire. Um, one thing that we need to note and to be aware of is that, because I don't want us to think, okay, well, that will happen then, but for now, like evil is reigning and for now, like, okay, I just gotta hang in there. No, experiencing eternity begins here on earth and experiencing eternity of both ends. Those who experience the paradise and the joy of the presence, the connection with God here on earth, they will, you know, while still in the body, they are living the kingdom life while still here in the body on earth. Yes, it is possible. I, ha I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly and have it to the fullest. Walking with God all the time. Because what is heaven? Heaven is being with God. Okay. And those, um, the, 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 in like the agony and the burning fire of hell while here on earth and the evidence of that they are in hell is that they're never satisfied in any sin that they go deeper in the deeper they go into the sin they keep seeking more and more and going deeper and deeper into their sin so it's they're never truly satisfied though they never find true comfort so they keep trying to seek it more and more and more so our eternal life whether it's good or bad we can begin, or we will begin experiencing it now while on earth. Um, and how do the people respond to God after all this? We will see that in the next chapter, which is chapter 31. Um, but before, before we go on to this, um, uh, it's 818. I don't know if we should start another chapter yet. Um, but before we go look into that, tell me like from this last section that we've just covered, if you have any questions or comments or anything, because we talked about a lot of stuff from 27 to 33. No questions? Okay. I would say. Okay. Go ahead. Is it question or comments? Questions, comments, anything. Yeah, I'd say, uh, like you said, Abuna, there is a turn, completely turn in the other way. So I would say God is merciful, but uh, we have to take it serious because the name of the Lord is uh, like uh, uh, fearful. So that's what happened, like turning, like open the door, but still you have to be serious. Yeah. I recall um, a bunch of chapters ago, I think it was in Isaiah, we were talking about, you know how some people love and appreciate like a police officer when they see one. And there's some people who like feel like anger and like fear when they see a police officer, like when they're driving or something. And what makes the difference is could be the same police officer, but what makes the difference is how is the person like driving? <laughs> if this person, if 
follows the rules and like drives the speed limit and all that stuff and has their seatbelt fastened. They're not like drinking and driving or any of the, that mad stuff. When they see the officer, they like, okay, so police officer, no problem. At the very least, there's no fear. They can even wave and say hello. But those who are living, I guess, driving, breaking the law and speeding and breaking signs or going through red lights and stop signs and whatnot, when they see the police officer, they will feel tension and nerve because they are living wrong or driving wrong. So it's the same police officer. That's the same like for us. How we view God is, is if we are, not only that, but if we are living according to God's words and commandments, it's not that only we don't have to fear punishment or anything. We taste God. That's the, 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 the reason why people, I guess you can say, get hooked on God and his word is that when a person takes a, a little step of faith, I'm not going to even call it a leap of faith, and, and follows God's commandments simply because God said to do that, they will quickly experience the, the joy and delight and the benefit that comes from obeying God's word. And this will reinforce them to want to do it more. And they do it more and they experience it more. They do it more and experience it more. And they get hooked on God. They're like, I want to change every aspect of my life to God's will. I want to live every day of my life according to his commandments. Because they don't want to let go of that, that delight and the joy that they experience from this. Abuna? Yes. Um, can you please confirm a point that um, when when we're when we are close to God or when we're um, far for some reason, you said that God doesn't hold grudges, and the common understanding is that when we're near, we're blessed, and when we're not, there's the wrath and we're punished. Um, how can just a normal person? Um, get over this um, maybe false belief that um, I have to stay close to God because I want to avoid consequences. Okay, so I want to say a couple of things about this. It's a great question. I want to say, the first thing I want to say is that that statement is true. When we are walking with God, we are blessed. And we are not walking with God, we will be punished. Not for the sake of vengeance or hurting us, but for the sake of like, you know, you know, tugging the ear a little bit to, to help us to return and repent to him. But the problem is that people interpret blessing and punishment wrongly. They interpret that like, you know, my job is great. My income keeps increasing. I keep getting the promotion. Everything I want keeps happening, like getting married or like my kids do great in life or whatever, that these are God's blessings. They are blessings, but they they determine that this is the only thing that is blessing and not getting those things that mean god is punishing me like i think if 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 we understand what is truly a blessing then i can definitely live with the statement um for example uh this is a dumb example but it's what i can think of right now so <clears throat> let's say an athlete right if an athlete, if their coach is, if an athlete has a wrong understanding, he might think that if they have a coach that makes them just sit there and eat candy bars and drink juice and not work out or, or train or do anything, oh, I have a great coach. He loves me. It's a great blessing. And another athlete who might have a coach who's working them to the bone, like almost till they drop dead every week, they might think, man, our coach is mad at us. Our coach hates us. Our coach, whatever. You have me our understanding is is not accurate yani what really is blessing and what is um detrimental you know what i'm saying so what we interpret as blessing or god is punishing me may be the opposite so what we may interpret as god is punishing me it, it may actually be a blessing to make me stronger more holy more righteous more patient more loving more humble so these are all blessings but the, or and, not but. The other thing I want to say to answer your question is that this is just my personal opinion. I remember talking about this at Bible study maybe three, four years ago. I don't remember. But our relationship with God or our, our choosing to live according to God's will and commandments, it, it's stages, okay, based on our spiritual maturity. Initially, it can begin with, I'm going to 
live according to God's will because I want to avoid punishment. Because, you know, if I don't, then bad stuff will happen in my life. Mish, okay. And then we go to another level, which is I want to live according to God's will in order to get blessings with whatever blessings me. Okay. And then we go to another level, which is I want to live my life according to God's will because I want to please God or I want to honor God. Okay. And then actually we get to a point where I want to live my life according to God's will because I've become more and more like God. I've been walking and living in according to God's will throughout all these previous phases. So now that that is who I am. I, I can't do otherwise. You know what I'm saying? So what I'm saying is, is if a person is living the life according to God's will to avoid punishment, it's not the ideal state we need to be in or the ideal men, mindset, but it's okay. Yani, as long as I'm living according to God's will, the reason behind it, it's okay. It will change. It will it will grow with maturity. Um, did I answer your question? Yes, thanks. I just wanted an answer for um, um, if somebody thinks that when something bad happens, then it's because he or she did something um, wrong. Against God's will. So I, I kind of I hate it when 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 people do this, I was actually talking with somebody about this, was it yesterday or today? Anyway, but like, I don't know why a lot of us have this mentality of like, I did something bad, so God is gonna punish me. Or God is punishing me because I did something bad. Did, like, now we talked as we, I mean, for goodness sake, if you've been with us reading Isaiah all this time, that the only time God tugs the ear a little bit is to bring somebody back in the right direction. And God is not vengeful on his children. He's vengeful on his children's enemies. Okay. So if I don't live my life according to God's will and things kind of are disastrous and don't go well, it could be simply a natural consequence because I'm not living according to God's will. Or it could be simply that I'm not aware of something that God is trying to get my attention. So if you begin to feel some pain, right away ask yourself, am I not living according to God's will? That I, is there anything in me that I need to return back to the right path? You know what I'm saying? It's not punishment in the sense of like wanting to cause pain. It is pain in order to cause me to change my ways. It's kind of when the shepherd is walking with the sheep and a sheep begins to go to the right or to the left where there could be thorns or animals or wild beasts or wolves or a cliff where they may fall. He'll poke them or hit them with the stick a little bit so they can come back on the right path. It's not to cause them pain or anything. I think a lot of us think this way because there are other religions I'll call it loosely on your religions, think that this is how God operates and we've been affected by this. And I think in another way is that we project human characteristics on our God instead of trying to, to project God characteristics on ourselves. So we look at, at God as, he, as a human being. When I, when I offend him, that he's going to get mad and he'll hate me or that he will hurt me just to cause me pain. This is not how God works. He is a father, for goodness sake. Yeah, you think about this. If, if a father loves his child, and his child is a pain in the neck, okay? That, that all the father wants is love, and, and like all the father wants is the best for this child. And the only time that the father may cause some pain in the life of the child by basically not giving them what they want or holding things back or or putting them in time or whatever, whatever. It's only so that they can change their ways and correct it for their own good. Our God does not, is not vengeful to us, if that, if that makes sense. Take, take this mentality or view. We need to really not look at God this way. He's so much above that. He's so much higher than that. Um, Okay, it looks like we're not going to go to chapter 31, which is fine. I didn't want to 
just do a few verses and then start it uh, from the middle next time. Anyway, so we're going to stop here and God willing, next time we'll, we'll resume with chapter 31. Um, but I, uh, I want to ask you if you could, Yanni, tell me something that stood out to you or something that you liked, or you're going to try to remember from today's Bible study or anything you want to ask. Yes, Abuna, can I say something? Um, I could see from this chapter actually more, Yana, and more and more of God. Because in every verse, I could see he is so patient, mm. so kind, and he doesn't want, as if he doesn't want to see the wrong, as if he is closing his eyes for some time, but he knows everything. And in the second half of the same verse, I can see how he is really uh, powerful. Oh, I, got, I got a little bit terrified when he says his fire and his anger and his devour. So I could feel really that how God is, I can't find any good shepherd like God. And I could feel he is the king of kings, and he wants all his children to be like him, to be children of the king of kings. So we should listen to him, but actually, even we, we go astray, as you said, he just uh, touched us to come back, come back, be aware, pay your attention, things like that, because God hates uh, punishment and hates Yani, uh, as it said in the in the song or in one of the uh, prophets, uh, your eyes are more pure than looking at the at the, at, at the bad things, you know. Yes, and he, he does not want the death of a sinner, but rather that he returns and lives. Yeah, he yeah. can't look at it. He wants. He doesn't want to punish us. He wants us. So he, he's you correcting know, us, um, he's disciplining us. Yes, history repeats itself from day one. You know, God created man in his image in order to be able to recipro reciprocatively, <laughs> to mutually love on each other, God on man and man on God, by mankind, right? And he created man in his image. He didn't, man didn't even have to ask for anything. He didn't, he didn't ask for anything. God created him when he was not. He chose to because he wants him. He wants that relationship and that friendship and that life together for eternity. And then the enemy comes in and he makes it seem like God's holding out on him. God doesn't want you to eat from the tree because when you eat from the tree, you will be like God. And he doesn't want you to be like him. So he's trying to get mankind to doubt God's love for him. At the end of the day, this is what it falls to. Is God really good? And the same thing happens right now. It's like stuff happens every... All that God causes, all things to work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. So the only condition here is that those who love the Lord. And God said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So if I am indeed, while I'll, I will fail daily, I will fall daily, but if I keep rising, if I am indeed trying to obey and keep God's commandments, which means that if I'm trying to love God, then be at peace. No matter what happened, God is causing all of it to be for your good. He's not punishing. He's not, I mean, avenging. God punishes, but he's, he doesn't work this way with his children. Um be careful to not let the enemy cause you to doubt who your heavenly father is. Because that's that's his mission. That's that's what he's trying to, to do. Um okay, tell me something you've uh, you liked, something you're gonna try to remember from this passage that we've covered. Wait the Lord. Wait. Wait on the Lord. But wait in an active way, not in an yeah. passive way. Awesome. And I liked it. Um, uh, when Even if we don't wait, he waits on mm. us. Shufu, yani, 
what more can we say? And I think God demonstrated how he deals with his children in this book of Isaiah very, very well. To the, the person who reads this and goes, Ya Rabbi, like, Lord, you, you're so amazing. I mean, they keep insulting you. They keep betraying you. They keep rejecting you. They keep acting so stupidly and blindly and going after all this stuff. And you keep calling and they keep ignoring you. And you keep warning and threatening and they keep ignoring you. And then you say, okay, if you just return to me, I will accept. Okay, Mesh, just, just look at me and I will take you into my arms. Um, he's amazing. What else? The, the burden of the Lord... For some people, it's light. For some people, it's heavy. Mm. It could be a devouring fire or a purifying, cleansing fire. Even though it's the same fire. It depends on who I am. Am I straw or am I gold? Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. good. Yes. The thing that I really... Um, Yanni, I'm going to try to remember from this chapter. I mean, there's so many things really, but the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs to it and it's safe. And to sit there and to kind of contemplate on, on those hundred names of the Lord and to like write down what they mean to me in my life, I think it will be a, a great, wonderful thing that will help me get to know God more and to know him better. Can I pose a question? Please. I love your questions, Amiri. <laughs> so when we're waiting on the Lord, we have to be patient, keep our eyes on him, uh, pray without seeing signs, self-examination, and all those things, at least what I'm seeing is it requires to be sitting in quietness and in a, in a quiet space to really focus on him. But my question is, how can we find time for quietness when we live in such a world that is saturating all of our time and taking away all of our time. Aside from turning off our phones and things like that, it just seems like we're constantly bombarded by something. So it's interesting that you said, how can we find, when we don't find that time, we make it. I mean, we make time for everything that we find uh, uh, we, we deem to be of value, right? We make time for sleep. We make time for showering. We make time to eat. We make time to go to church. We make time to make an appointment to a doctor. We make time to show up for work consistently and for long hours. So, yes, there's a ton more things tugging at our attention and distracting us. And all that means is just that we got to work hard. I know people, for example, that um, when they, when the evening comes and they're about to uh, go to the room or, you know, go to read or, or to just talk with each other or relax or whatever, they, they charge their phone on the kitchen counter, like away, or they, turn the phone off completely. They use an actual alarm clock. You know what I'm saying? Um, I know people who do not put a TV in their bedroom. I know a lot of people do that now. Um, what I'm saying is that if our fathers, the bishops, for example, who I really feel for them because there were people who left the world and they went to the monastery, you know, to just be kinda with God, and then surprise, like you become like responsible for thousands of people in like many, many churches and many services. And, and, you know, I mean, oh my gosh, like I can't describe the busyness. And yet they managed to find the time or to, sorry, I said find. See, I fell into that. They managed to make the time to have their quiet time with God, to, to, to pray, to praise, to read, to nourish themselves. Because if they don't do that, they would crash and burn right away, right? So it takes intentionality, it takes planning, and it takes just simply seeing the value in this and the doing it. And I would recommend if somebody's going to start doing this, let's say now with the great fast coming, don't start like with going cold turkey. You know what I'm saying? Just 
begin with a plan of like a little bit every day or a little bit a few days a week or whatever and then for the first couple of weeks and then increase that a little bit and then increase that a little bit and so on um so that you increase your chance of success don't bite more than you can chew don't do like a a crash diet um does anybody have like any anything to add to this to to answer um, uh, Mary's question? Well, I have something that deals with getting distracted. Okay. Um. So, when you mention the people that they leave the phone to charge in the kitchen, mm -hmm. because the phone can be in distraction. Yeah. So I found that if I keep a notebook by my bedside table while I'm trying to read or whatever, if a random question comes oh. up in my mind, like, oh, I wonder what the weather is, or I wonder how you make this thing, then I can just write it on my notebook and I can look at it later. But then I feel relaxed that at least I got the question down and I can look, you know, research that later. Yeah, you won't be <laughs> worried about for forgetting it. Amy, that was actually my follow-up question. I was going to ask how we can manage our own thoughts because our thoughts can be distractions. And sometimes you think of like the laundry list of things you have to do and then, you know, you get off track, but that's actually a really good idea. I didn't think of that. Yeah, it's really helped. I mean, I don't know, just like the most random questions can come when I'm trying to like, especially trying to read the Bible and all of a sudden now I need to research you know, vacations to Hawaii or something, but then I, you know, so I'll just say research vacations to Hawaii and put it in my notebook. And then I know it's there for later. Yeah. A lot of the times we mull things in our mind because this is our, a, a way for our, for our brain to keep track of something. Uh, I remember actually Amber Yusuf was giving us this recommendation several years back. And he said, like, when you're praying and you find something is distracting you, you can pause your Agbeya prayer, pray about this thing, and then keep going. But then if it's something like a to-do list or something like an item that you need to do or something, he said, when you go to pray, have like a little notebook next to you, write it down, stop your praying, write it down, God will not be mad, and then go back to your prayer and you'll find that you're not so, you know, occupied with it because you wrote it down, your brain now can rest because it knows, okay, it's written down, we'll take care of it. Um, so that's that's a that's a great tool as well. And I, I'd like to add to this is that do your best effort so that the last the first thing you do in the morning when you wake up is not reach for your phone from your nightstand, you know, and look at stuff and see the text and the emails or the news or the whatever. And the last thing you do before you get, go to bed, also don't let it be your phone where you are catching up on stuff or browsing on social media, whatever. They actually, there's some science about like the, 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 the light of the screen and how it messes with your brain and how you don't sleep well. And of course they compared this with making the screens that make the blue light or yellow light or something. But um, there, there are, it is definitely a busier, faster world, but those who want to will make it happen. Those who want to invest in just a, a little bit of quiet time with God and they see how it like stabilizes them and anchors them and makes them feel so great and stuff like that, they will stick with it and they will maybe even increase it. A good question. Uh, okay. Anybody else? All right. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and pray. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. The Heavenly Father, God, um, your love is truly amazing. Your patience and your kindness and your pursuit is beyond even the kindest and the most loving and most patient Father. Um, it's hard for us sometimes to comprehend how you operate with us and why do you even want us and why do you love us and why do you sacrifice so much for us? And, and I guess we, it's something that we will not understand, but I, I hope that we at least accept and receive and rest in it and behave accordingly. Thank you, Lord, for loving us so well. Father, help us to understand the, the 
the power of your precious name and how truly it is a mighty fortress that we can run into it and hide into it and be safe and we can rest. Help us, O Lord, to be people who are determined and intentional and living a purpose uh, driven life so that we may um, plan well uh, for our spiritual feeding and our time with you because that's where life is and that's where heaven is. Help us a lot to fast an acceptable fast for you uh, these coming uh, couple of months during the great fast. And let it not just be a change of diet or a change of ingredients, Lord, but a, a, a fast that is acceptable to you in which we fast from other things and that we grow closer to you. Um, please remember, oh Lord, our blessed and honored father and teacher, Abu Dhamikari, and lay your hands on him, O oh Lord, and get, grant him uh, healing and, and mercy, O oh Lord, and, and comfort and encouragement. Um, and patience. Um, we ask the Lord to please hear through the intercession of St. Mary and all you see in some modest who please the from the beginning of the body, power of your love, given cross. Please, O oh Lord, make us ready to pray thankfully, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us as they are daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for them is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now the love of God, the Father, grace is on. We got Son, our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ. The communion and the gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you. Thank you all so much. We'll see you next Thursday, God willing. Bye, Habib. Salam.